the bible says that part of faith is to believe that god is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him we know that faith is one of the most important things men uh, emphasized in the new testament and all of us would say we have faith we believe but i want to ask you this morning whether you really believe that god is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him if another brother or sister has progressed more than you <clears throat> are you willing to acknowledge that it is because he has sought god more diligently or she has sought god more diligently than you have you know we are right from the days of adam who blamed his wife we are great makers of excuses excuses that justify ourselves uh when if another brother or sister is more wholehearted we tend to excuse that saying well god's called him for that or god's gifted him with that we'll never say that's because i've not sought him wholeheartedly because that puts the blame on me you see we try to put the blame on god so well god's called him for that so therefore he is gifted him like that of course god nothing to do with me i am a wonderful person and that's why we never progress it's exactly the thing what the devil wants you to say the devil wants you to say there's nothing wrong with you oh well, god's called her for that so she's like that or he's like that or if somebody knows the scriptures better than us we say well that's because he's got a good memory of course nothing wrong with me i'm a wholehearted brother but he's got a good memory you know there are numerous reasons like that you see another brother who's children are following the lord your children are not well you say children are different we are such experts at making excuses i just want to encourage you my brothers and sisters if you want to go on with god get rid of this adamic habit of making excuses if we see some other church has got something which we don't have we say yeah but then of course they uh, have some other problems we're okay and as long as we keep on saying i'm okay my family is okay my church is okay you're guaranteeing for yourself that you'll never make progress that's a habit of adam to make excuses it's far better to say god i haven't sought you diligently i have not sought you with all my heart and that's why i haven't got what someone else has got that that could be mine if i see god in the same way there are many people who seek the baptism in the holy spirit and uh, if they don't get it they say well maybe it's not god's time i'm okay you see i'm <laughs> perfectly okay but god has some plan we don't realize that in all our subtlety and cleverness with which we make excuses we are actually only damaging ourselves i decided years ago i'd never make an excuse i if paul said follow me as i follow christ and my life is not as radical and wholehearted as paul's i wouldn't say well that was because paul was called for that i'd say lord there's something missing in me i've been recently challenged as i've been many times reading the acts of the apostles about the tremendous power those apostles had and you know the excuses well, those were for the early days you know that's Uh, the master of excuses the devil has got plenty of excuses to fill our clever mind with this is the early days and uh, those are only for certain people and and it's the same old story as long as we make excuses we'll never experience what god wants us to have so i'm just wondering i wondered about myself see i've been a believer for 45 years and i ask myself this question i don't know whether you ask it lord is there something you wanted me to have which i have missed out on so far if so i want it i don't want to leave this earth missing out on a single thing that almighty god wanted me to have or experience on this earth will you pray that prayer to god sincerely those of you who are serious lord before i leave this earth i want to experience everything that you 
want me to experience and have before I leave the earth. I mean, if there's something I'm going to have only in heaven, that's fine. I don't want it now. And if there's something uh, you want only certain people to have because that's their calling. I mean, it's true that certain people have certain gifts because they're called for that. We don't all have to have those gifts. That's fine. I'm not interested in having gifts which God doesn't want me to have because it's not part of my calling. And I don't think you should desire that either. But what God wants you to have, you must have such a passionate yearning and longing that at any cost, whatever price you pay, have to pay, however much inconvenience it may cause you, God, I want it. I want it at any cost. I'm willing to pay the price. Send me the bill. I'll pay it. You know, that's the earnestness that God honors. Jesus always spoke about those who are sick and tired of their own life. That's the meaning of weary and heavy laden. Come to me those who are weary and heavy laden. Those who are sick and tired of your life. Of the way you're living. Or Jesus said, if any man thirst, thirst, what a word. Desperate thirst. Come to me, he said. God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, he's, imagine for a moment, Jesus is standing before you right now and saying to you personally, as if nobody else is in the room, this Jesus and you and Jesus saying to you, I have plans for you, plans for your welfare to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11, to make your future glorious, to do something wonderful for you. It doesn't matter how old you are, even if you're 85 years old, 90 years old, you haven't died yet. Maybe you've got one more week to live. God says, I've got plans for you for that one week. Don't you want to do something in that one week? Even if you're 90 years old, before you go. I would, if God said to me, you're 90 years old, you've got one more week to live, but I've got plans for you for that one week. I say, Lord, fulfill it before I go. You don't have to be young. It doesn't matter how old you are. And if you're a young boy, Think of it, all the years, and God says, I've got plans for you, plans for your welfare, to give you a future and a hope, but you've got to call upon me for it. You can't just sit back and lazily and say, oh, it'll happen. It won't happen. It will never happen. You'll miss out completely. You've got to call upon the Lord, verse 12. And it says in verse 13, you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. It's the same old story. Whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, God, there must be something. Well, I haven't got that. Something I missed. I want to seek you with all my heart. I want to seek you with fasting and prayer. And I've often wondered, why does God want me to go hungry? Fasting. You know the answer? I can answer it in three words. I don't know. lot of questions I can answer in three words. I don't know. Then why do I do it? Because Jesus commanded it. That's all. That's all. I'm a son who lives by faith. That my father tells me to do something. I don't need to know the reason. How would you like to have a son who, three-year-old son or five-year-old son who says, Dad, you explain to me why I should do it, then I'll do it. Boy, you bring up your children like that. <laughs> You're going to have a headache. Why should they do it? Because daddy said it. Because mommy said it. One day they'll understand when they're 25 years old. We haven't got there yet spiritually. So God, Jesus said it. I, I tell you, I haven't understood the logic of prayer. I haven't understood the logic of prayer at all. You think God is not more burdened for India than I am? Of course he is. The things we pray for. Are we informing God about something he didn't know? Are we trying to have a burden? Are we trying to twist God's arm and say, God, you've got to do this? I haven't understood it. I, and the reason I don't understand it is because my mind is like a cup. God's wisdom is like an ocean. So I'm not surprised. There are lots of things in the Bible I don't understand. You know, that's why I've discovered the more intellectual and more logical you are, the less you pray. It's true. I've seen throughout my life that those who are very clever, they pray very little. Because unconsciously the logic works. No, There's no need to inform God. He knows everything. And then I've seen simple poor people who don't use all their logic. They pray and they get something. Which these intellectual people miss out on. Consider that. Consider that possibility. God says, you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. 
And I've been thinking about the title of the Holy Spirit. You know, we've seen many titles of the Holy Spirit. Spirit of truth, Spirit of love. Here's the title of the Holy Spirit which just struck me. Romans chapter 8. I don't know whether you've seen this. I'm sure you've read it hundreds of times, but sometimes we read and we don't notice it. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead. The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead. That's the Holy Spirit I want to be baptized with and I want to be filled with. The greatest problem of man is death, spiritual death. It's not sickness, it's not poverty. Jesus was poor, Paul was sick, Timothy was sick. This, those are not man's biggest problems, but spiritual death. And Jesus came to earth to conquer that spiritual death. If he had not conquered that, all the good that he had done, heal the lepers, did kind things, wash disciples' feet and all that would have been useless. He, didn't, he did all those things, but he primarily came to conquer spiritual death. Because death was reigning over all men. See Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, it says, verse 12, Through one man sin entered into the world. And when sin entered into the world, death also, through sin. That's what the Lord told Adam. In the day you eat, you will die. And we know he died because the contact with God was gone. It was like pulling out the plug. It's like telling a child who doesn't know. If you pull out the plug, the lights will go. Or the fan will stop working. God said to Adam, you... You don't want to live dependent on me, you'll die. And he died. The lights went out on his life and one of the clearest proofs of it is he started accusing his wife. You know the lights have gone out in your life when you're blaming other people or blaming God. The lights have gone out, brother, sister. You're in darkness. Well, you, you may not know it, but you are in darkness when you're blaming your wife for something or blaming your husband or blaming the elders or blaming your brother or... Or, or if elders blame the brothers and sisters. Oh, these brothers and sisters, they're wretched. If I blame you, lights have gone out in my life. That's one of the clearest proofs. The lights have gone out when you blame other people. Adam did that. The light went out in his life. Life went off. And since death spread to all men, because all have sinned. Now listen to this. Verse 13. Until the law, the law came through Moses, maybe about 2,500 years after Adam. For 2,500 years after Adam, all that period, there was no law. So when there's no law, you can't sin. For example, if there's no sign on a road saying no entry, people can go in and out. I mean, even if the police have in mind, well, nobody should go through this road. If they haven't made a law there, there's nothing wrong. So where, the point is that where God has not given a law, he doesn't ask you to be responsible. You're not, you're not guilty because I haven't told you that's wrong. For example, our children, they may do something wrong, but if you have not told them that's wrong, you know, you can't blame them. Sometimes your child may come back from school and use a bad word. You know, he's not really guilty because he doesn't know it's a bad word. We, you ask him, where did you learn that? Oh, one of the boys used it in school. What does it mean? I don't know what it means. But it's something you say when you're angry. <laughs> okay. And then you have to t tell him, okay, now there's a law. That's a bad word. Don't use it anymore. Then he's guilty after that. But up until then, it's a bad word. He should never use it, but he's not guilty. That's what God says. Where I've not given a law, you're not guilty. But what I want you to notice is, even if you're not guilty because there was no law, sin, death um, still reigned. Verse 14. 
death doesn't make a difference. Death doesn't discover whether you know the law or you don't know the law. It just rains. You know, nowadays they say they've discovered that if you eat too much uh, coconuts and uh, butter and cheese, your cholesterol level goes up. But supposing somebody hasn't studied that. He said, no, I didn't study it, but I just keep on eating all that stuff. Do you think the cholesterol will say, oh, this guy hasn't studied it, so we better not uh, raise the cholesterol in his body? No. It doesn't matter whether you know the rule or not. <laughs> I mean, if you know the rule, it's good. But if you don't know the rule, still, the laws of the body still work, whether you know the laws or not. It's the same thing here. Uh, okay, you didn't know the laws, it was not deliberate, fine, you're not guilty, but death still reigned. Whether you're guilty or not, death still reigned all the way from Adam to Moses, because spiritual death has got nothing to do with laws. That's what I want you to notice. No. Spiritual death has got nothing to do with laws. It's like cholesterol. It doesn't know, death, cholesterol doesn't bother whether you know the rules or not. <laughs> it just operates. Death is like that. It just operates in our life whether you know it or not. And law may have come through Moses, but death was from Adam. And it makes absolutely no difference whether you know the law or not. And you know, some areas you may say, well brother, I don't have light on it. It doesn't make a difference. Death still reigns in your life, even if you didn't have light. So what? Uh, some other area you say, well, I'm still pressing on. That's fine. But death still reigns in you. I I'm, brother, I'm struggling to get victory over anger. That's fine. Take 20 years to get victory, but death will reign over you all those 20 years. That's not going to make an effect. You know, it's like saying, brother, I'm trying to give up butter and cheese and all that in my life. That's fine. You can take 20 years to give it up. You probably may not live 20 years, but uh, these things take over. The laws of the body. It's got, the laws of the body, you've got nothing to do whether you're struggling or you're not struggling. Guilt may be another thing, but death reigns universally because death is connected to sin. And Jesus came not to bring more laws. Laws don't help. He came to bring something that will deliver man from this death that's reigning. That's why resurrection is so important. That's why, you know, Jesus said, you must be witnesses of my resurrection. And this is the apostles always talk about being witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is going to fill me. That means all death of every sort is going to gradually disappear from my life and one day it'll even disappear from my body when Christ comes again. That, that means death won't even be able to touch my body one day. But it begins in our spirit right now. That's the meaning of being raised from the dead in the resurrection life. Even my body, will, death won't be able to touch it anymore. But this is the wonderful gospel. The gospel is all connected with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there's such an emphasis on Jesus' risen life, risen life, his resurrection is not just that he rose, but that I can experience that power. And it's not something which we can understand, you know, I can explain this to you and you can listen to 10 messages on it, it won't help. We've really got to ask God to open our eyes of our heart to see it. And when we see it, it's tremendously different. I want to show you here in... Ephesians in chapter 1. When Paul was writing to the Ephesian Christians, he says here in Ephesians 1, he says, you guys are great believers because I've heard of verse 15. I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, your love for all the saints. You know, that's got to be a pretty good church if it loves all the believers. Don't you think so? They love all the saints, not just the folks in their own group. And they don't see, he says, I don't cease giving thanks to you. Verse 16, I'm, but I also pray for you. You, you fellows are wonderful believers. You're, you don't have any wrong doctrines there in the church in Ephesus. But I'm praying for something else. I'm praying, verse 18, uh, verse 17, that God the Father will give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. You know, revelation is a New Testament word, not just understanding, but revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart, not your mind, it's very important to distinguish between the mind and the heart. When you study physics, chemistry, geography, you've got to use your mind. It doesn't matter if you don't use your heart. 
But when you study the scriptures, it's your heart. It's the only book in the world where you got to use your heart. Maybe love letters also included in that. But other than that, it's, it's, it's the Bible that's where you got to use your heart to hear what God is trying to say. I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. That means Paul is praying that I pray the light will be switched on in your heart. That you'll see something. You know how you go into a dark room and you can hardly see anything. There may be some wonderful things there. You can't even see it. And when the light is switched on, you suddenly see it. That's what he's praying. He says, in your heart, I pray that God will turn on the light. And you'll see something. Now, if this was something we could understand with the mind, you know what Paul would have said? Paul said, please read what I'm writing ten times. Read it ten times. Read it again. Read it again. Read it again. Read it again. You know, that's what they said in the Old Testament. Meditate, meditate, meditate. It's good to meditate. Well, I'll tell you something. Sometimes God just turned on the light and I haven't been meditating. Hey, that's amazing. Lord of the light I have got has not come through. I mean, I've also studied the Bible carefully in order to fill my mind with the knowledge of Scripture. That's important, particularly if you're in a teaching ministry like me. But more important than that, see most of you are, I mean, most of you are not in a teaching ministry, so you don't have to know the Bible so well like I need, I need to know it in the mind. But all of you need to know it in the heart. And it doesn't matter if you can't teach like me or explain the scriptures like me or illustrate and make things simple like me. That's a calling for teaching. But to understand in the heart, you have to say, Lord, just switch on the light. And I know different times in my life when, and I'll tell you something which may surprise you, 90% of some of the things which have really opened my eyes about things in the scripture, I have discovered by revelation when I am fellowshipping with other believers, not listening to a message. Sometimes in a message, but very often when just sitting and talking to other believers. Hey, I got light on that. And that person sitting there may not even know that I got light. Something got turned on in my heart. And I sought the Lord about this. And I said, Lord, why is it that I seem to get more light when I'm in fellowshipping with other believers than when I'm just sitting reading the Bible on my own? And I felt the Lord say, say to me that it was because he wanted me to recognize my dependence on the body of Christ. You know, we are such independent people. One of the sins we never confess to God perhaps is our independent spirit. We're independent. Children are independent. And we grow up independent. If that independent spirit is not destroyed and we don't learn our dependence not only on Jesus but on the body of Christ, we're not going to grow. I think, I'm not exaggerating. I think 90% of my revelation on scripture I would not have got if I had not valued other brothers in the body of Christ. And it doesn't matter what their denomination is. It doesn't matter. I got light from reading Mother Teresa. She's a Catholic, not, not on Catholic doctrines, but on some other things about love for Jesus. So what I'm trying to say is, be dependent on the body of Christ. You're not going to get it all on your own. You lonely, individualistic type of people, you're going to be, you're going to miss out on something which you're really going to regret when you get to heaven. Learn to value the brothers and sisters and learn to fellowship with them and say, God, switch on the light in my heart. So Paul says, I'll just show you a verse on that in Ephesians chapter 3. He says in verse 18 of Ephesians 3 that you may be able to understand or comprehend along with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which passes human knowledge. See, there's a love of Christ you can understand with human knowledge. You know, you study about it, you read about it, people explain it with stories. You say, oh, that's another love of Christ. You see a movie on Christ and you see the love of Christ. Fine. But there's something that goes beyond knowledge. It says surpasses knowledge. Do you know that there's something of the love of Christ which goes beyond no matter how much you read, no matter how much you hear a message, you can't understand it. It's not like history and social studies and all that. This is something which goes beyond knowledge, but you can see it in your heart if you seek fellowship, it says in verse 18, with all the saints. 
One of the things I have said to myself is, listen carefully, every person in the body of Christ, every person, he may be much younger than me, maybe a new member in the body of Christ, every person in the body of Christ has something to teach me. And I want to learn that. I mean, there may be 10,000 things I can teach him, but there may be one thing which he can teach me. I want to learn that. Something of Christ, something of, of, for example, if I don't have an evangelistic passion to reach people to Christ, to witness people, and I meet a brother who sits in a train and he's immediately witnessing to somebody, and before the end of the journey he's led him to Christ, don't you think I can learn something from him? Instead of sitting back and making an excuse, oh, well, that's not my calling. I believe that if we are open like that, you know what will happen in, another f in five or ten years? You'll become spiritually a fantastically rich person. Because you're learning something from that person and that person and the other person and somebody else. You meet in another denomination who doesn't have the light that you have on maybe 10,000 things. But you see something in him and you got the humility to say, there's something there I want to learn. There's something I want to learn there. There's something I want to learn from that person. And here you're going around the world, meeting different believers and just picking up things. Can you imagine what a fantastically rich person you'll be? I become tremendously rich this way. Even people whom I don't agree with in so many things. I learn something from them. Yeah, I say there's something I can learn there. I, I, I may reject 99 things and pick up that one thing. I'm not saying we should pick up everything. You see, the trouble with a lot of believers is they, uh, they appreciate something in a brother and they go wholesale for that. It's a bit risky because there may be things there which are not, you've got to be careful. I mean, there may be some brothers where you can pick up 90% of the things, but not, maybe not 10%. And then some other brothers and even some servants of God, maybe you can pick up only one thing. A lot of things which we can't pick up. You know, I've thought of some of these folks who've got a tremendous healing ministry. Some of them have such a compassion for people. And I say, God, I want to learn that. I don't want to um, learn um, how to raise money through those people because that's not the way Jesus raised money. And I leave out all that. But ignoring all that, now I disagree with them completely in their methods of ministry and all that, but look at their compassion for sick people. Look at their compassion for people who are suffering. I say, God, I don't have 10% of that. That's something of Christ. Because Jesus had such compassion. But we rule out the whole person completely just because his attitude to money is not right. I agree. I mean, when you go to get your scooter repaired with somebody, you don't find out how he's getting along with his wife and things like that before. I only want to find out, can he fix a scooter? I don't want to find out his attitude to money and whether he loves money and whether he lives properly with his wife. It doesn't bother me. If he can fix my scooter, I get something out of him. If I want to fix my teeth, I don't go to him because he can't help me there. I go to somebody else. Don't we do that in life? You know, we go to different people because that fellow can help me here and this fellow can help me here and the other chap can help me in somewhere else. It's like that. Here's a brother who can teach me something which I don't know. Let me learn that. Let me get it from him. I, he may be so prejudiced against me that he says, Oh, I can't learn anything from Brother Zach. He's a heretic. Fine. He's enriching me, but he doesn't want me to enrich him. Who's the loser? Who's the loser? If you're this exclusive type who says, no, we are the only holy ones in CFC, I'll tell you something. I've seen people who have that attitude who feel the only real wholehearted believers in the world are the ones who connected to CFC. You'll be some of the poorest believers in the world. I'll give it to you in writing. I never want to be like that. We've got to have our heart open. We may not agree with other believers, and because of that, I cannot work with them. Do you know that if John Wesley were in Bangalore, and John Wesley, by the way, lived in 1700s in England, was one of the godliest men in the history of the church. Do you know that if he were in Bangalore, he and I would not be in the same church? How do you like that? Because he'd sprinkle infants. <laughs> I said, sorry, John Wesley, I really respect you as a godly man, but I can't sprinkle infants and call it baptism. What do you do then? Every time a child is born, John Wesley says, we've got to sprinkle him. And I say, no, we're not going to sprinkle him. 
Okay, brother, I'll meet you regularly, but we'll have to work in separate churches. And somebody asked me, what do you think of John Wesley? I think he's the godliest man in Bangalore. Why don't you work with him? He sprinkles infants. I don't believe that's the right way to baptize people. So what I'm trying to say is, the other person in that church may be ten times more godly than I am, but I'm not working with him because there's an area where I'm absolutely convinced, and I'm sure there John Wesley is wrong. There's one area where I'm right and he's wrong, and that's the matter of baptism. But that doesn't mean I'm more spiritual than him. Can you acknowledge that? That you could be right in some area, another much more godly man could be wrong, but yet he may be a hundred times more spiritual than you. If you can acknowledge that, you're on the way to becoming a spiritually rich person. Lord, there's something of the life of Christ. Along with all the saints, it says here, with all the saints, you can comprehend the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the love of Christ. Paul wrote in four dimensions. Have you heard of four dimensions? Length and breadth and height and depth. It's amazing. That itself surpasses knowledge. That's exactly it. It goes beyond all uh, geometry and all that type of stuff. Isn't, it's beyond mathematics, you know, four dimensions. Height, depth, length, breadth. It surpasses knowledge. Okay, chapter 1. Let's come to chapter 1. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. That means something should be switched on in your heart. And that you may know, number one thing you need to, there are three things mentioned here, and I want you to see it. Three things we've got to have the light switched on in our heart to know. Number one is the hope of his calling. That Jesus called you, perhaps all of you know. Why did Jesus call you? Can you give me an answer in one comprehensive sentence? There may be many, many things, but all comprehend in one sentence. Why did Jesus call you? And that the answer to me for that is in Romans 8, 29, where it says very clearly that um, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that Jesus might be the first or the eldest among many brothers, and these whom he predestined, he called. Okay. So when I go to that verse, I understand why did God called me. He called me for one reason. Not to go to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God called me to go to heaven. You know, I want to surprise you with some of these things. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God called you to go to heaven. You know what the Bible says? He called you to become like Jesus. And that starts right here on earth. It ends when we get to heaven, but it starts right here. He called me to be more compassionate. He called me to be more holy. He called me to look at women, Jesus, the way Jesus looked at women, with absolute, total purity. He called me to look at money, the way Jesus looked at money, with complete detachment, using it, but not attached to it. He called me to look at circumstances, the way Jesus looks at circumstances. You know, God is in control, that faith. He wants me to be like Jesus. And at the same time, he wants me to be like Jesus in my ministry. Jesus had such a tremendous passion to serve God and to do something for his father. His whole life, he's, he, once when he didn't even eat food and he, say, he brought one soul to God, that Samaritan woman, and um, the disciples, he told his disciples, I've already eaten my food. My food's over. You fellas have brought lunch for me now, but I, I got a soul saved and I'm so excited about that, I lost my hunger. Have you ever lost your hunger because a soul got saved? Or something, God did something, and boy, you say, I don't feel hungry now because I've eaten something. If you've not known that, I believe we should know that many times in our life. That type of excitement that God did something. I'm so excited that I'm not really bothered whether I eat or not. Think of the number of believers who complain about food and all types of things. How, what a million miles they are away from being conformed to the image of Jesus. So I'm just telling you these things, you know, how... We really, God's will is that I might be exactly like Jesus. One of the things that's exercised my mind over the last few weeks is the subject of partiality. I've been thinking much about it. Partiality. I've been asking myself, Lord, is there any partiality in my life? Jesus was totally impartial. He looked at his mother and his brothers and said, these are not the, my, my mother and brothers are these around me who do the will of God. He valued the brothers and sisters around him. 
more than he valued his own family members. Can you say that? This has to be like Jesus. You say, well, my family members were believers. Do you know that Jesus' mother was perhaps the godliest woman on earth at that time? It's to her, he said, my mother and brothers are these who do the will of God. If you are in that category, fine. But you're not going to be in that category because you're my physical mother or my physical brother or my physical son or anybody like that. No. We know nobody after the flesh. You see, that's the resurrection life of Jesus because all the rest is part of that death that came through Adam. Sometimes, you know, when we talk about death, we, or we talk about sin, we don't, we've got a habit of not seeing the sins that we really have. We think of sins like adultery, murder. I mean, you go to a worldly person who's unconverted. He's also got the same list as you have. And I want to say to you, if you make a list of sins, and your list of sins is the same as that worldly person's list of sins in the same priority. That is one of the clearest proofs that you really haven't come to know God yet. If I make a list of sins, it's going to be totally different from what the worldly person, he puts murder, adultery, theft and all at the bottom. I put selfishness and pride and hypocrisy and partiality and thinking evil of others and speaking evil of others. These are the things in my list. It's completely different from the world's list. I hope because these are the things Jesus spoke about. For example, every idle word that man shall speak, he's going to give an account in the day of judgment. Which worldly person puts that in his list? For that matter, which believer puts it in his list? A lot of believers don't. That shows that they don't have a passionate desire to become like Jesus. They don't have a passionate desire. They haven't seen the hope of his calling. The average believer, I tell you this, I met lots of them. The average believer, his only calling is, I'll go to heaven when I die. I'm going to be finished with this miserable old world. I'll tell you, people who have that hope are going to be tremendously disappointed when they go to heaven. They may make it to heaven, but they'll be disappointed when they get there. Because God will tell them, you know, the reason I kept you on earth for 25 years after you were converted, was that you'd use those 25 years to become a little more like my son. But you let me down pretty badly. Okay, I've got you give me a place in heaven, but... Ah, you can shout as much as you like here that you love Jesus, but... You know, it mattered on earth whether you did that. I believe we need to ask God for light on some of these things. The hope of his calling. The hope of his calling. And the second thing it says here is, in Ephesians 1 is... I pray the light will be switched on your heart to see the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Ephesians 1.18. Not my inheritance in heaven. That's great to think about that. But the Living Bible says, I want you to realize that God became rich when he got you. You look around and say, is it me? You're talking about me? Yes, you. God became rich when he got you. Can you believe that? Almighty God who knows, who wants nothing, needs nothing, says, I became rich when I got you. Man, God owns all the planets and stars in the universe and the Milky Way and all the other things in the universe, but he says, that didn't make me rich. You know, it's like, uh, some of these multi-millionaires have got houses and lands and gold and everything. They don't have a son. And then they get a son and they say, boy, this is my wealth. All the other was just rubbish. That's how God feels about you and me. Huh? And if you don't believe it, you'll be a miserable person. One reason I'm a very happy person is because I believe it. It's a daring thought that God became rich when he got me. You're almost scared to say it. I wouldn't say it if it were not in the Bible. But you know, even though it's written in the Bible, some of you are scared to say it. Oh, I better not say it. That's blasphemy to say God became rich when he got me. That's having high thoughts about myself. No, it isn't. It's just speaking the truth. God became rich when he got me. Why? Because he paid the blood of his son to get me. Have you understood what a tremendous price God paid to get you, my brother, sister? That wasn't easy. How many of you would go through mountains and 
rivers and deserts and uh, <laughs> suffer uh, everything possible, loss of all your money and health and everything to get the girl you love. Boy, boy, I say you really love that girl. That's how God, that's how Jesus got his bride, you know. God sent his son to suffer everything to get you. It's unbelievable, but it's true. And it's because it's unbelievable, Paul says, I pray that the Holy Spirit will give you revelation. Your light will get turned on in your heart. It's not just that gifted brother there. Even you are not so gifted. You know, when you realize this, it changes your whole attitude to the Christian life. Many of us, we hear exhortations, be wholehearted, be wholehearted, be wholehearted, and you're trying and trying, and you're not wholehearted. Brother, the Bible is boring, and I'm not this. You know, you, you pray this. You say, Lord, just show me how rich you became when you got me, and see if it doesn't change your whole attitude to the Christian life. That's what Paul's praying for these Ephesians. I pray that the light will be switched on in your heart to see such a miserable backslider like you. God still loves you. And he became rich when he got you. And he's disappointed that you don't appreciate that. You know, God is disappointed that you don't appreciate sufficiently. That you're still hankering after something in the world. When God says, hey, you're mine. You know, I became rich when I got you. Why are you always after those things? Why are you not a little more interested in me? That, that's the thing. If pray that God will open our eyes to see how rich you became when he got me. It says in verses like Zephaniah that God rejoices over us in love and it's really exciting to think that Almighty God who needs nothing in this universe loves me so intensely cares about me so much uh, have you read this amazing verse in Zechariah chapter 2 Zechariah 2 verse 8 the last part the Lord says he who touches you touches the apple of his eye, of God's eye. You know, the most sensitive part of your body, in case you didn't know, is the apple of your eye. It's very painful if something touches that. Any other part of your body is not so painful, but the apple of your eye, you know, somebody touches with a finger. Which part of your body pains if somebody just touches with a finger? The apple of your eye. It's so dangerous that if you allow somebody to do it two, three times, it can even damage your eye. It's that sensitive. And God picks that and says, do you know when somebody tries to harm you, he's touching the apple of my eye. I'll tell you this. That's what scares me of ever doing harm to another believer or speaking evil about another believer sorry I won't do it because that's the apple of God's eye I mean maybe there may be a hundred things wrong with him there are a hundred things wrong with me also in different areas perhaps I will not touch the apple of God's eye make that rule in your life I will not touch the apple of God's eye let God deal with him it's not my business now, I'll tell you in my younger days I was foolish nobody taught me these things you guys are so lucky that you hear these things I, I wasn't taught these things and I went around touching many apples of God's eye, left, right and center, here and there, and I suffered because of it. I'm just telling you folks, don't do it. Don't do the stupid things I did in my younger days and suffered. I, I really reaped. And I said, Lord, I'm going to be very careful. I will not touch your anointed. I mean, even if the anointing was once upon him and it's lost, David said, okay, Saul may have lost the anointing. But once he was God's anointed, I'm not going to touch him. It's not my business. Let God deal with him. How wise David was. And God said, David, you're a man after my own heart. You, you really have a sense for these things. But look at the ways today believers hit out, criticize, take people to court, fight this, that, and the other. Do you think these people have the slightest fear of God? Zero. Now, we may not go to such extremes, but I just want to say to you, just leave other believers alone. The whole Bible is full of stories. The whole Bible is full of stories of how God dealt with people who touched his beloved children. Do you know what God dealt with Cain, starting with Cain? Cain did something to Abel. God punished him in some way. I don't know how 
Cain himself said, oh God, please, this is terrible what you have done to me. That tough hard man got humbled and began to weep before God because the punishment was so bad. That's how the Bible begins. You touch one of God's children, God says, this is what I'll do to you. That scares me. I want to be scared. You know what happened to Pharaoh when he began to trouble the Israelites in Egypt? God says, you're going to trouble my children? I'll teach you a lesson for centuries. The whole world will know what I'm like. It's true right through the Bible. Anybody who troubled God's children. It was like that. Think of Saul who harassed David, harassed David, harassed David, tried to kill him. Okay, God tolerated it for many, many years. And God may tolerate for many, many years people who are harassing you and troubling you. But boy, when the day God begins to deal with them, I would not like to be around. It'll be terrible for that person. And I don't want to be in that number. I don't want to be that number who goes around criticizing this person, that person, the other person. No, it's not my business. God is their judge. And that is a tremendous comfort. You became, God became rich when he got you. And if somebody touches you, he's touching the apple of God's eye. Leave it to God. I know times when, you know, particularly me, I serve the Lord and anyone who serves the Lord is the target of Satan's attack. And Satan attacks through people. And through the years, many, many people have attacked me. Some of it you know about, a lot of it you don't know about. But God's always told me this. Do you want to deal with that person or will you let me deal with that person? I say, Lord, you deal with that person. I'm not going to deal with that person. No, it's not my business. It's God's business. You know that when you touch the apple of your eye, your eye does nothing. <laughs> it's some other part of your body that says, you better watch out. That's it. It's something like that. I'm the apple of God's eye. Somebody touches me, the eye does nothing. God deals with that himself. That's a comfort to know that. People, I, somebody harassing you in your office, just love him. You know, I hear so many complaints about uh, people in, say, brother, this church, they're not treating me right, and that office, they're not treating me right, and my husband, your husband's not treating me right. Your husband's not treating you right, and you're a child of God. Boy, I tell you, I feel sorry for your husband the day God deals with him. <laughs> I wouldn't like to be a million miles near, the, near him when God begins to punish him for the way he treated you, a sincere child of God, or vice versa. We don't realize it. God is very long-suffering. He waits a long, long time, but boy, when he begins to judge. Look at the time he waited in Egypt, 400 years. But when he began to judge, oh, it's terrible. They got frogs and lice and all types of things happened to them. They, they just couldn't escape. If they went to drink water, that would become blood. It was terrible. And then finally their eldest son died in every home. It's terrible when God begins to judge. Don't you harass your wife or your husband if they are God's children. Don't do it. Steer clear of it. Don't take advantage of your position of superiority over another person, maybe somebody is dependent on you. Don't ever take advantage of it. Don't take advantage of people who are lower than you in society. Don't look down on people who are poorer than you or lower than you in some way. It's dangerous. It's extremely dangerous. I wouldn't even like to treat a beggar like that. Be very, very careful because God, they are God's special property. So that's the second thing we need to have a light switched on in our heart. And the third one, he says in Ephesians 1, is, he says, I want to have the, you to have the light switched on in your heart by the Holy Spirit concerning the tremendous greatness of God's power available to us, not to everybody. God's power is not available to everybody. Sorry for giving you this bad news, but God's power is not available to everybody. But it is available to everyone who believes that God will do it. Everyone who says, Lord, I believe you're going to do that for me. I can't think of a single person in the Old Testament or the New Testament who laid hold of God like that and was disappointed. Particularly something concerning God's will. For example, there are hundreds and thousands of areas where we don't know God's will. For example, you're in love with some girl and you want to marry her. and You're absolutely convinced that that is God's will. I've met lots of people like that, but the girl is not convinced. What do you do? I tell the boy, that's not God's will. It's simple to me. <laughs> if it is God's will, he'll convince both sides. 
not just you. But you say, I'm going to claim it, I'm going to claim it. You can claim it till all eternity. And you may get her by, by hook or by crook, mostly by crook. But you'll, you may get her, but, it, <laughs> but you won't be happy. It's not God's will. <laughs> See, there are a lot of things like that we try to claim by faith. Boy, I want to get a car, a more expensive car, or a bigger house. Or something. These are not the third type of things. Start with things which we know are God's will. Okay? For example, are you in debt? Let's start with something. Let's start with ABC stuff. Don't go to this PhD stuff. Start with ABC stuff. Are you in debt? The Bible says, oh, no man, anything. You say, Lord, I'm absolutely convinced. Romans 13, 8 says, I should owe no man anything. That is your will. But I owe people money then it must definitely be your will that I should be free from it. That's one area where you can definitely ask God to answer you because you have no doubt about God's will. So I say start with the areas where you have absolutely no doubt about God's will before you go into those other areas. Other areas also over a period of time as you get to know God, you can know God's will better but before we get into that there are things clearly revealed. And start with that. Say, Lord, I, I want to become free from debt, whether it takes one year or ten years. I want to be free from debt at the earliest possible time. And I want you to help me. I want, you to, I want to trust you that your mighty power is available to me. I trust you. You'll help me in this area. Or if you're battling with anger. You say, Lord, I'm absolutely sure. Ephesians 4.31 says, put away all anger. It's clear in God's word. All anger must be put away from my life. Not 99.9%, 100%. Lord, I haven't put it all away. I, I'm absolutely convinced this is your will. I want to believe that you'll do it in my life. There are various areas like that. Lord, I'm still lusting with my eyes after women. I'm absolutely convinced your will is that I should be pure. That I should never watch one thing on internet pornography even once. Not even soft porn. Leave alone hard porn. If you don't know what that means, don't try and find out. Just leave it. <laughs> There's some people who know. <laughs> so I'm speaking to them. It's really true. And you be, I've been on the internet for years. I've never seen one single thing. Because I'm, I'm immediately, I know this is suspicious. I say, I don't want to see it. I know it's possible. If you're radical, but if you're not radical, you slip up and say, oh, God, please forgive me, I did that. And you do it again and say, God, please forgive me. And where are you going to go from there, brother, sister? You're destroying yourself. You're taking poison and say, no, please, give me a stomach wash. And you take another day poison and give me a stomach wash. You know what's going to happen to your stomach linings after some time? Be careful, be careful. You're destroying yourself, nobody else. And you say, I don't have power. Exactly. That's why we need to ask God, Lord, I don't have the power. Please help me. Help me to overcome this. The exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. Now I'll show you. This power, listen to this. There are many manifestations of God's power in creation and so many other things. But the greatest manifestation of God's power, it says here, is when he raised Christ Jesus from the dead. Back again, we are to the same old subject. The power that raised Jesus from the dead. I told you how death has spread everywhere. Internet pornography is death. Lusting after women is death. Anger is death. Love of money is death. Selfishness is death. Pride is death. Spiritual pride is death. <coughs> Hypocrisy is death. And this mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to me if I believe. Lord, you mean to say that I can experience a power that lifts me out of all this death? I want to know that. It's not rules. In the, uh, when people were under the law, they were living under this death. God gave them so many hundreds of rules, they never got out of death. And God said, this is just to teach you. To teach you that you will never become holy with rules. Have we learned it in 2004 AD? Do you know the number of people who still think that you're going to be holy with rules? You can't. I mean, you can appear to be. It's like um, the illustration I've used of a pig. If you keep holding a pig with chains, 
You can keep it clean, but it doesn't change the nature of the pig. Even if you hold that pig for 10 years with chains, once you release the chains, it's still a pig. But God's doing something better. He's going to change the inside nature so that we don't love that filth like a cat doesn't love filth. And God who can give a cat a nature like that can give me a nature that loves purity. That is the resurrection life of Jesus. And we want to say, Lord, I want that resurrection life. I want that resurrection life in me that lifts me up above spiritual death. Will you seek it? Will you say, Lord, this resurrection life, this power of the Holy Spirit, I want it in my life. At any cost, I want it in my life. I'm going to seek you for it. One last verse. Romans chapter 8 and verse 3, uh, verse 2. He speaks here about the law of the Holy Spirit compared to the law of Moses. The law of Moses had ten commandments. The law of the Holy Spirit is not commandments. It says the law of the Holy Spirit. Please remember this. You've heard of the law of Moses. Here's the law of the Spirit is life in Christ Jesus. It's written there. The law of the Spirit which is or of life in Christ Jesus. It's not a law. It's life has set me free from all this death. There's a law of sin and death operating here. How am I going to, haven't you struggled for years to be free from the love of money? Haven't you struggled for years to be free from the lust of the eyes, from free from the lust of pornography and anger and, yeah, okay. Now shall we seek for something which is not, which is not according to laws and rules but the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, life in Christ, that resurrection life, I believe that's our calling. And that's what we need to go around the world proclaiming, that Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen and I'll tell you, I, how do I know? Because he's done something in my life. I could never have overcome this with any number of rules or determination. But Jesus set me free. Let's bow our heads for a moment. As we think about what we heard this morning, will you pray with all of your heart, my brother, sister, that God will switch on the light, switch on the light in your heart and show you something in these areas that you have never seen before in your whole life. Lord, what I need is not understanding. I need revelation. Give me something that turns on the light in my heart that changes my life completely changes my values changes my attitudes and help me to experience that mighty supernatural power of the Holy Spirit that lifts me up and I'll tell you something it will even affect your body when it begins to affect your spirit it will affect your body as well and if you have sickness you'll find suddenly you're getting healthier you get healed from sickness too when you let resurrection life enter your spirit you know how when bitterness enters your spirit, you get sickness? If sin can produce sickness, can't resurrection life produce a little bit of health to overcome that sickness? I believe there are lots of believers who are sick. For having sicknesses they are not supposed to have. Ask Jesus' resurrection life. The spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead will give life even to your mortal body, it says. Heavenly Father, help us to enjoy the privileges we have in Christ. We... The devil's robbed us of so many things, but he's not going to rob us anymore. We're going to get it all back from him. We're getting it all back in our life. Everyone here. We're not just claiming it for one or two, but everyone here, Lord. And our children must have it too. In Jesus' name.